and to question systems of oppression that continue to, through to the present day um, and to educate ourselves about the origin, the original stewards of, the, of this land. We also want to acknowledge the Haudenosaunee, um, iron workers of the Six Nations in, uh, of Iroquois, mostly the Mohawk tribes who built and labored on many of the iconic skyscrapers and steel bridges in New York. As recently, of, as, recently as 2012, about 200 of those 2,000 structural iron workers in New York City were Mohawk. Every day we view the skyline of Manhattan and we're reminded of their contributions. So we'll like to um, maybe take a moment there uh, to let that sink in, but also um, definitely want to welcome Holly Bass. Um, and you see Holly Bass over there. So a few things that I want to say um, before we start, um, particularly for students of design technology. Um, you know, you come to this program and a lot of students um, have the sense that, oh, we're here to learn about technology. Um, but technology is does not exist by itself. Technology is connected with society, is connected with history, um, is connected with oppression, is connected with so many other things. And part of what we are here to study is also how technology interacts in, in, in all those many ways. And I think most importantly to have, to ensure that we have a, a capacious understanding of technology. Um, that's to understand technology as include, inclusive of, let's say, ritualistic performances, um, inclusive of um, uh, um, indigenous epistemologies and such. And with that in mind, that's why we have um, somebody like Holly Bass here. Her primary mediums are performance art, poetry, and dance but her work also includes photography, audio recordings and installations. Um, she creates solo and un ensemble performances with professional collaborators, as well as public art um, works uh, with untrained community members. Her background is in journal journalism um, and that influences the research that she does and um, the work and her artistic practice and how she investigates. As a, as a as a working artist, she embraces creative, the creative economy model, which views artists as vital and active contributors of, of their community. And as an invested community member herself, she believes uh, she believes in forging uh, life purpose and thinking about beauty, uh, no matter the circumstances um, that we find ourselves in. As a friend of mine, as a, and a longtime collaborator, I'm just going to say she's a bee's knees. And I want to say I've learned so much from her over the years um, in working with her and just interacting with her. And that's why, that's why she's here, because I'm getting to appreciate her. And I would love for you all to come to some appreciation of her work and methods. All right, thank you, Ayo, for that introduction. I'm excited to get started. Um, I do have uh, a slide deck or deck. I guess you're not supposed to say both. I have a deck of images. I opted not to share video, even though much of my work is performative. I just generally am not always pleased with how video shows up uh, on Zoom. So um, at some point, I'll probably drop some links in the chat if there's something specific that I reference and people would like to be able to watch it at their leisure. But we're starting today. Um, I also appreciate with Io's introduction, uh, some context around technology. So if we could go to the next slide. So I'm starting with the idea of rememory. And this is a quote from uh, Toni Morrison's book, Beloved, and the character is Setha. I was talking about time. It's so hard for me to believe in it. 
Some things go, pass on, some things just stay. I used to think it was my rememory. You know, some things you forget, other things you never do, but it's not. Places, places are still there. If a house burns down, it's gone, but the place, the picture of it stays. And not just in my memory, but out there in the world. What I remember is a picture floating around out there outside my head. I mean, even if I don't think it, even if I die, the picture of what I did or knew or saw is still out there, right in the place where it happened. So we'll go to the next slide. And I put up some definitions. So none of the work that you're gonna see has elements that I think are traditionally considered technology. I have pieces where I used a microcontroller, you know, or like um, something that's a little bit more electronic, but I want us to think about time and technology and rememory. So I put some definitions, really simple. Um, technology, the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes, and machinery and equipment developed from the application of scientific knowledge. So this idea of equipment that's developed from knowledge. Then spiritual, related to or affecting the human spirit or soul as opposed to material or physical things. Ancestral, belonging to, inherited from, or denoting an ancestor or ancestors, and retention, the fact of keeping something in one's memory, the action of absorbing and continuing to hold a substance. So I sometimes like to talk about the idea of spiritual technology and ancestral technology. And we can get into that a little bit more in the conversation. Uh, let's, next image, please. So this is a piece um, called Black Space, and it is a house. Um, it's basically a little tiny shotgun house. And the foundation of the house, um, let me start my timer. The foundation of the house is based on the map of Washington, D.C., which is uh, like a diamond that has some part of it cut away where uh, Virginia asked for its land back. So it was meant to be a, a perfect square that's 10 miles by 10 miles. So this is a sort of uh, scaled down version of that map, but it's also a house because it's meant to be a container for memories, for culture. When I moved to DC, it was 70% black population and the nickname, you know, from I'm thinking from the seventies and certainly it was still used in the nineties when I arrived was Chocolate City. But uh, about, yeah, around 2010 was the first time in uh, probably 50 years that DC lost its black majority population. And so now it's about 45% black, about 40% white. And then the rest is made up of other um, ethnicities and cultures. So this has been something that's featured in my work a lot is ideas of gentrification, but also with that physical displacement, what kinds of cultural losses occur and can we preserve culture? Next image. So this is the side of the um, house where you can see that uneven wall, which we made out of uh, corrugated steel. And those tape lines on the floor actually represent the the DC Metro line, so the subway. So those are the lines that are going into Virginia. And then the floor is quite literally a map. So you can see sort of in an abstract way, I used wood burning to burn lines and circles into the floor and then have the tape extend outward um, to sort of further the map. Next image. This is the how it's being activated. And so here's where I feel like I begin to um, draw on ancestral mem memory. So part of the house, it was an installation, you could walk through it. And here it's at a, a local art fair. The previous slide, it was actually at the main library in DC. Um, but I'm gathered here with uh, a poet who is also a Yoruba priest, a drummer who's also a farmer, and 
a curator who's also a scholar and, and singer and performer. And this idea of all of these um, different strains of Black cultural life meeting on the porch. And from there, we actually engaged people in a kind of ritual around home and Black space asking questions, what's the most beautiful thing about Black space? What's the saddest thing about Black space? What's your role in Black space, whether you are a Black person or not? Next image. There were also um, dances and a rent party. So drawing on kind of um, certain Black cultural traditions that I may not have taken part of myself because they happened in the 1940s through the 1970s but there's still a part of either researched history or um, history that's been passed on through oral traditions. And so I, I feel comfortable drawing on those types of uh, images. There's also, you can't tell in the, in the top image, the people sitting down are actually um, playing dominoes. So that was another thing that was important to me. It's, it's an international game, but it has certain resonances in the black community. So it was like, we're gonna play domino, we're gonna drink, we're gonna play music. People came out and danced. And then I would sweep the porch from time to time and, and welcome people in. Next image. So here's a variation on that project. This was in Detroit. Um, I was in Detroit in 2018. Uh, for a, no, no, I'm not telling the truth. It was 2019. It was 2019 for uh, a Red Bull artist residency. And if we could go back one image. So we went to the farmer's market and set up a story collection station. And this is a project I initiated first in Washington, DC, but have now taken on the road called cultural preserves. So this idea that in the same way that you can can fruits and vegetables, you can symbolically can people's personal stories and histories and preserve them. And it's also this idea that cultural preservation isn't just about brick and mortar buildings and architecture, but also humanity and, and the stories that we sell. So um, it makes me think a little bit of uh, Neri Ward has a beautiful piece called Canned Smiles. I think that's the title, but he asked people to smile into a jar and you would put the lid on and capture their essence. So if we think about technology and something that seems like it's devoid of technology, like capturing someone's smile and putting it in a jar, but there's something about that to me that actually seems super high tech in, in other ways. If we think about spiritual technology or ancestral um, technology. So next image. And this was another workshop. Um, I was experimenting with cyanotyping, but also uh, just a way to bring people together to talk about their lives in Detroit, how it's changed. And I find that um, doing these community gatherings along with an art project opens people up to share in ways that they may not have shared in the past. So we'll go to the next image. This is a completely different body of work. Um, this is one of my durational performance pieces. It's called Moneymaker. And these two images took place, um, oh, I'm not gonna remember the years, a long time ago. Um, I'll find it. It might be, it might be 2011. Um, I didn't print out my notes for my, my captions for my images, but, it's called Moneymaker and this was at the Emerge Art Fair and I danced for five hours and um, the gentleman in the gold hat, he's a reference to uh, James Brown and have these cape men and they would come and like bring him a cape and escort him on and off stage and they would dry his brow and bring him water. So I, I had a cape man and then I also was um, sort of evoking James Brown with my hair and costume. And this is the very, very first iteration of this piece, next image. And then uh, I guess about a year later, I ended up performing it in DC at the Corcoran Gallery of Art when it was still a museum. And it was part of the 30 Americans show. 
So this is uh, a black and white image from a distance, but depending on where you were standing, I might be silhouetted. And then in the other gallery, that's all the way across, there's actually a room full of Cairo walkers. So people would be seeing a moving silhouette and then paper cutouts on the other wall. This was also um, a piece that you could see from the outside of the museum. So you didn't have to go inside and pay if you didn't want to, or you could stand sort of just inside the museum before the desk. So there was this idea also around accessibility and just making it sort of possible and visible for anyone who wanted to see it. Um, people had to walk underneath me to enter the museum. So it may not be totally clear what you're seeing, but there is uh, sort of these very high glass doors and we built a plexiglass stage with a wood frame around it. It was maybe an inch, maybe. <laughs> and that's what I was performing on. So people could look up and see the performance as they were walking inside and they could see it from outside and inside and from different vantage points. Next image. And that one was uh, eight hours and it had evolved the costume. So in this image, I, I created this sort of homage to James Brown with the cummerbund. He always had a cummerbund that said uh, sex on it, um, but mine is with dollar signs and euros and then the American flag shoes. Next image. So this is, we'll come back to that red jumpsuit and moneymaker. This is a very different body of work, but again, dealing with um, memory. This is my father. And this is, this body of work consists of some videos and also some still images. Um, most of the images were for the exhibition. They were printed on um, silk and hung either in front of mirrors or um, sort of furniture elements like a headboard. Um, but my father told me a story about growing up in a family of sharecroppers. And so he had told me years ago, this really um, kind of, I found a captivating story about the most cotton he had ever picked in one day. And he was 15 years old and it was 1960. And he picked 300 pounds of cotton um, 350 pounds of cotton, I believe. No, I'm getting this wrong. Sorry, give me a moment. 214 pounds of cotton. And he earned $7.50. And he worked from can't see in the morning. Is what we say. Can't see in the morning till can't see at night. So that means before the sun rose, when it was still dark, and then after the sun had fully set. Um, and so there's a lot of things about this story that are amazing to me. Uh, one of the things that's amazing to me is that this young man completed this her heroic feat for himself, essentially. And he was so proud of it that, you know, here's something that happened when he was 15 years old and he's telling me about it when he's in his late 50s and that he remembered all those details. So it was clearly important to him. And one of the sources of pride for him was that he earned more than he would have gotten at a factory job. So this is the 60s, it's a transition between the agricultural and the industrial world in the South. Um, and he, through his own physicality, was able to earn more than, you know, someone working in a factory, which is kind of considered a better job. You know, the idea was like, you don't wanna keep working in the fields forever. You wanna move up in the world. But he was able to sort of raise his station from where he was standing. I also am struck by the fact that, you know, if I think about like, wow, progress. So in 1960, you know, the equivalent of a black man's labor was $7.50. And in 1860, it was $0, you know, like during slavery, it was zero. So in a hundred years, it increased from zero to $7.50. So that's a way to think about time and progress, right? Like currency and inflation and, and valuation. Uh, next image, please. So this is, um, this is actually a video still, and we are, it's called crossing, and we're crossing a field. So he's leading the way and I'm, I'm following behind him. 
And um, he explained to me when he was growing up, uh, because of the technology at the time, cotton was planted in rows with pathways in between because they were using human la labor, not machines. The um, cotton gin started to become popular in the early 60s. And eventually there's, in, at least in the US, people generally don't pick cotton by hand. So nowadays, so the, the fields are just full. There are no rows, there's no pathways. And so we're making a path where there is no path. And um, this is not necessarily the exact field he worked in when he was younger, but it's in the same area where he grew up. And so there's this idea too of like, who should own this land? Like, even as black folks, we're settler occupiers, but if we think about sweat equity, I would say that we have a claim to these lands as well. Next image. And this is just a, a sort of portrait. Um, it's actually part of a series. So I start with cotton in my hand and, and let it fall. Next image. So now we're coming back <laughs> to Moneymaker. And this image now is from uh, October, 2020. And this was performed at New York Life Arts during the pandemic. And it was an opportunity to try to um, create something that was socially distanced. So the, I was inside of uh, this sort of glass entryway the entire time and the audience and, and the technicians and the video crew were all outside and it was on the street. So um, I think many of you are familiar with New York Live Arts and Chelsea on 19th Street. So people would, um, some people were coming because they knew about the show. Some people just happened to be walking home from getting their groceries or, you know, going to work. And so there were all these wonderful interactions that happened. Um, next image. And this piece, so the first piece was five hours. The second piece was um, seven and a half, eight hours. And this was 12 hours. So it was in reference to, in part to my father's story of working from sunup to sundown. So I wanted to do a 12 hour durational piece. And uh, obviously you can't hear, there's a soundtrack of music. It has a lot of James Brown and Motown and R&B, but also this was tied to um, the election and it was the first day of early voting in New York City. So we actually had a ballot collection box, which is a little bit crazy to me that like pretty much anyone can go down <laughs> to, um, you know, the voter registry office and say, I'd like to collect ballots and people can actually bring their ballots to you. And then you promise that you'll turn those votes in. Um, but also a lot of the uh, soundtracks celebrated um, Black women politicians in particular and activists like Shirley Chisholm and Fannie Lou Hamer. And so this, when I do these durational pieces, I also create a soundtrack that is the length of the piece. And so that soundtrack becomes a kind of memory map for me to sort of guide me as I'm going through these different phases of like, woohoo, I'm excited, we're dancing. And then like three hours in and my feet are already sort of blistered and, um, you know, the shoes are, are a situation. And um, then I try to design the music so that it can help propel me through the performance as I get tired, as I um, transition, as the morning light becomes evening light, becomes darkness. So those are all parts of the um, parts of the the piece and how it comes together. So I feel like every little element has meaning, um, and I do feel like I draw on a kind of spiritual or ancestral technology to propel me to to be the engine for the work as it were. There's also um, a reference several times throughout the soundtrack. I play the Jackson 5's dancing machine. So that's also this idea that I feel like I become a human machine of, of movement propulsion, but inside of the parameters of this um, glass box, light box. So I believe that's the last slide. And 
I think we can stop there. And I'm gonna, um, I'm looking forward to your questions, but I'm also just gonna quickly, I'm present, but I'm gonna look for the uh, live stream of the video of that piece so I can drop it in the chat while we're talking. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Holly. Um, yes. Um, could, could you, I'm, I'm just gonna start off a little bit. Um, you know, you talk about, um, you talk about labor with um, Moneymaker. Um, could you touch a little bit on the outfit itself? What are, are those basketballs that you have attached to you? Why, you know? Yes, yeah, so they are basketballs covered in gold lame. Um, I originally, I have seen many, many iterations of this work and he had a gallery in Washington DC where I did a very early iteration. Um, they weren't even basketballs. They were like these blue children's balls. Um, that sort of costume piece, which is sometimes called body orb or booty ball, um, it came out of this idea that I, I had of black female technology. And there's a comedian named Phyllis Stickney. She has a really great monologue called The Power of the Booty. And I thought like, what if in the future, like the booty is not just something that is powerful because of its allure or because of um, its, its physical shape, but what if it's a source of power in a literal sense, like a personal jet pack and you can transport yourself to different locations and space and time using it? What if it's um, kind of like a camel's hump and it has nourishment and food and water and you could sustain yourself with it and replenish it? So I was having those kinds of musings. I was, um, this is 2006, actually. I was at an art residency in Florida and I just went to, you know, like the local Kmart and bought a bunch of balls and bought some spandex and, um, started pinning together and sort of making a prototype. And then eventually, um, was able to work with a, uh, a really talented textile artist in Baltimore, um, to, uh, Sharda Conaway to really make a, a sort of more beautiful encasement. And so there's a version of it that actually looks like basketballs. And there's, I didn't put any of those images in this uh, particular deck, but it's, it's on my website um, where you can see that in WBA series. And there were just some pieces in New York, but that show closed a couple of weeks ago um, or a piece. And it's also the Gold LeMay version, which I think of it's just like the more sort of glamorous, um, alluring, seductive object. So it, it has its different iterations. Uh, yeah. Are, are you making any reference in, to the modification of the female black body? And um, let's say, um, well, yes, and, I am. And, and Sarah, Sarah Bartman, and you know, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's there's just something really interesting that you're doing there. Um, can you speak a little bit to that? Sure. So, in the original sort of framework of Moneymaker, the two sort of guiding figures on the one hand, there was James Brown, who was known as the hardest working man in showbiz. And then on the other hand, I was doing a lot of research about Sarah Bartman, who is better known as the Venus Hottentot. She was a South African Khoisan woman in the 1800s who was um, sort of told that she, if she went to Europe and performed you know, songs and dances that she'd be a big star and make a lot of money and then be able to retire after a few years. And um, the folks that were interested in bringing her to Europe knew that there was, at that time, uh, Georgian Britain and France were really obsessed with the booty, not unlike our current society. And Sarah Bartman had very large buttocks. Um, 
which were fairly common or normal among Khoisan, but were um, not at all common in England at the time. And she really was a big star. Um, I, she's, I feel like in many ways she's been reclaimed by international feminists as a, as a figure of exploitation and, uh, you know, uh, sexual exploitation, um, this sort of uh, image of her body and how it was um, used without her consent in many ways. But she was in fact a, a sort of show theatrical phenomenon like King George of Britain came to the performance. There were posters of her everywhere. You can find old sort of, um, I wanna say linotypes, but you know, just sort of those drawings of England and 18 whatever and see tiny little posters of the Venus hot and top around. So I, I like to say she was sort of the Nicki Minaj of, you know, the 1880s, 1860s. I have to apologize that I'm, a, I normally am very, I'm very sharp with my dates and times and I'm not tonight. So I'm just gonna own that. And, but that's why Google exists and Wikipedia and the um, links are in the chat, but, yeah, she was definitely a phenomenon and she did sing and dance. And so I was really interested in reclaiming that side of her as an artist, as a sort of like black woman artist, maybe in the same tradition that we might put a Billie Holiday in. So someone whose um, talents were in some ways overshadowed by the hardships of their life. And to what would happen if we sort of think of Sarah Bartman as an artist and not just a figure who was exploited. I'm going to invite folks to, um, to drop questions in the chat or um, just unmute your mic and go ahead and ask. Yeah, go ahead, Sam. Thanks, Holly. Uh, I'm really fascinated by a lot of things about what you've shown, uh, but I want to ask a specific question about just, it's a simple question, but uh, one that I think will resonate with a lot of people here. What's it like to work with your father? And, and you know, how does he view what you're doing? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I really enjoyed that process of working with my father. He's um, very... Um, trying to like, so he's this like black Southern man, grew up in a very small town, worked, you know, his mother was like the hardest working woman I think I've ever met in my life. I remember I would spend my summers in Georgia and she would just be like, you're so lazy. Why are you still in bed? It's 8.30 in the morning. Like, and I'd be like, grandma, it's summer break. And that was, so we had this like big culture clash where she was just like, I don't understand this lazy child who sleeps in every morning and I'm like, but I got A's in school. So this is what I get to do. It's like sleep in in the summer. So then he immediately joined the military. He was a career military man, um, retired as a, a chief and you know got to travel the world and experience things. But he's very much so like a man of his era. So I think what's actually nice for me about working with him is that he doesn't put on airs. And he also, he's just deeply supportive of me. So he's like, well, if this is what you need for your art, okay, I'll do this. I'll put on this suit and I'll walk in these cotton fields and I'll, you know, um, so he's actually really easy to work with as opposed to some of my other relatives who are very performative. <laughs> and, you know, it's probably where I, I get it from, but it's like, I need you to take it down a notch. Whereas my father, I can just sort of give him an instruction. So it's actually, I think, um, when you think of performance art and where you don't want to uh, layer on too much that's inauthentic, he's ideal in that sense, in that he's, he's always pretty straightforward. Um, I will tell this interesting anecdote. So he came to the opening of Root Work and it was in Maryland and he brought his friend 
And they were like, it was really sweet because they were like, well, we want to support you because it's your opening, but we thought we were going to buy some of your art, but we didn't realize that these were going to be like in the thousands of dollars because, you know, they're just like, oh, if it's a couple hundred dollars, she's got these photographs, you know, these videos. So it's also not really part of his world. Like the contemporary art world is not, um, yeah. So that was, that was interesting. And I was like, yeah, sorry, dad. <laughs> um, I don't know if that fully answered your question. It, it does. I just, you know, I, uh, I, I'm just fascinated by the, by the connection of your working with your father and your, your, you starting out with, the, you know, the uh, statement about time and uh, the relationship that family for all of us has with history. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's so much that we wouldn't know about history if we hadn't learned it through our parents or through our grandparents. It's not like we're automatically going back. I mean, sometimes you do, but um, I, I'm just, uh, I'm kind of in awe of you bringing him into your work like this. And it, you know, I'll, I'll go watch the videos, which I haven't seen yet, but uh, I want to ask one other question about mm -hmm. him. Did, did he, uh, did he attend any of your long form performances has he no so um i think he watched online the um, new york live arts performance and my mother also watched it online which was interesting so um both my parents they're divorced but they are very i'm i recognize i'm very fortunate in that even from a young age my parents supported my creative endeavors but they I didn't like grow up in a family of artists or anything like that. Like these are sort of regular, like my mom grew up in Alabama, um, worked like also from a very young age, like as a child minder and um, as a cook, and then like eventually had her own restaurant and things like that. But like, so, you know, this whole museum and gallery and like abstract and conceptual and durational performance, it's, it's different for them. Um, also, my mom is not really a fan of the performances I do where I'm wearing the golden body orbs. But I think because I think because my aunt was trying to scandalize her and be like, did you see your daughter on Instagram doing a headstand and shaking her booty? My mother was like, oh, well, yes, of course. So she, so she was like, I want to see this performance. And she was like, I loved it. And I was a little bit like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you the link. You don't have to watch all of it because we live streamed three of the 12 hours. And she's like, where's the rest? <laughs> it's like, okay. So yeah, um, I, I love them and they love me back. Um, but they're still parents, very much so. Looking out for any any student questions. Oh, wait. We got one in the chat, so I'll read it out loud. Okay. As a performance artist, but I can't quite, I have to be honest, I can't see who it's from. I just see L-I, and I can't see the rest of the, maybe it's Leela, Lila. Um, as a performance artist, do you ever receive unexpected audience reactions? How important is the audience, viewers, if at all? That's a really great question. Um, and the answer is yes, I always receive unexpected audience reactions. I will say with the um, Moneymaker, and I have a, a similar piece called Pay-Per-View that's um, instead of the red jumpsuit, I'm in all gold, but it has the golden booty orbs and it's a progressive peep show. So the curtain closes and opens, but someone in the audience has to put money in a hat in order for the show to keep going. So it's not a free show. But in all of those performances, there's always interesting interactions. One of my sort of favorite things I love is children will stop and their parents are like, what's going on here? And the kids are like, no, we want to watch the lady in the window. Like, yeah, we're going to stick around here. And then the, you, you can sense sometimes 
Um, especially if it's a mom, they're sort of like, I don't know, is this good for my child? Is this okay? Is it age appropriate? And children are like totally fine and they get it. And like, I really love interacting with them as they, um, they come up. Um, some great things, people will dance with me during this piece. Um, and also people will stay way longer than I think is, you know, sort of possible. Um, oftentimes I realize or find out in retrospect that many of those folks who stay a really long time are also artists in their own right. So that idea of being able to sit with someone and support them or, or continually dance with someone, and which is really delightful. Um, at this New York performance, something really wonderful happened that was quite sweet. Uh, a guy had stopped, he was just running errands and stopped and watched a show. And he went to a florist, came back and presented me through the glass with this, this beautiful bouquet of white lilies and like indicated like, these are for you, I'm gonna leave them. So it was just wonderful. I finished the show and there were these flowers from a stranger waiting for me. Um, there have also been negative interactions, not so much with the moneymaker and pay-per-view, I think because the music is there and people are dancing and it feels like a community celebration. But I have a piece called, um, one of the variations is called Come Clean, where I invite the public to wash my hair, which is a very intimate act, especially if we're doing, talking about sort of um, transracially, because traditionally black women, um, you would only have like a family member or a professional touch your hair. You wouldn't have like my father's, nowadays dads do their daughter's hair, but like back in the day, it wasn't really a thing. And so, you know, it's not like my fathers or uncles ever had their hands in my hair um, and certainly not a stranger. So I've done that piece and it's gone really well. But one time I usually have also a group of uh, black women co-performers who are my, I call them water bearers and they sort of coordinate and they like vet the people who are gonna do the hair washing and they like, you know, pass the water that's poured and the, like all of that. And the one time the security was like, oh, a friend of the gallery really wants to participate. So we're like, okay. And she turned out to be like this, just saying horribly racist things while like she was at that point doing the oiling and it was so awkward and it was painful for the audience and for me. And I felt very trapped because when I do that piece, I sit in the sort of traditional you sit between someone's knees. So they're on a bench and you're like on a cushion on the floor. And it was, it was really just terrible. Um, but the, the people who were there and you could see the audience, even their faces, they were like, what is she saying? Um, so I felt this kind of responsibility to the viewers, Leela, but I also, you know, and then people felt the responsibility to me. So there was this kinship being formed, but also this like terrible thing happening. And so we managed to like, just extract her, like be like, okay, your time is up. The, the folks who were supporting me in the performance and then replaced her with someone else who was a young white man who was there to play violin during the gallery show. And he was fantastic. And it was sort of like, we needed to cleanse the air like we can go around with sage or whatever but like at least sort of energetically um clear the air and he was lovely um but i that reinforced for me that the the sort of rules that i set up in my performance rituals they're there for a reason even if i don't fully understand them at the moment so that's again i think that spiritual technology or ancestral technology coming into play where i'm like i feel like i need like this sort of buffer of support, these black women, and this is what they're gonna do. And when I deviate from that, that's when things can go off the rails. But as long as I'm rooted in those traditions and those retentions and have the right energy around me, even if things go wrong, the weather goes wrong or tech, you know, the sound goes out or whatever is happening, we can still, um, I think, 
create a sense of connectedness, which is really what that work is all about. And most of my work is all about. So thanks for that question, Leela. And I another see, question? Yeah. Let's hear some voices. So shy. I know. Hi, um, thanks so much for your presentation. I was also wondering if you ever make um, iterative versions of these performances or like switch up the like set, not, not the rules necessarily, but the procedures, I guess, as you perform in different locations? Yeah, I would say that I feel like my process is very iterative and it's about what you learn in the performance and what you want to sort of carry forward and what you want to modify. So sometimes that has to do with the external pieces. And sometimes it also has to do with resources, like from sort of one initial piece to the next iteration, you know, hopefully you get a few more resources. So you're like, oh, I can, that thing I wanted to do in the first iteration, but I couldn't, now I can do it. Um, but I think I also learn a lot about the audience and how they're going to um, typically respond so that I can start to manipulate that actually. But that can change when I um, go to a different city or a different country particularly. So I remember doing um, pay-per-view in Paris at an underground club and I was having a great time, but all the other artists in the collective, they, they were like, this crowd is too rowdy and they were really worried for my safety, but I was like, no, I'm <laughs> this is, you know, whatever performance artists can be a little crazy maybe, but I was like, I'm going to keep going. And they were like, you're shutting it down. That was your last round. Like these people are out of control, um, which was also something I wanted to elicit because it was similar to what Sarah Bartman experienced in Paris. So I was sort of drawing on that history of like, if I give an inch, how much will you, try to take and there was no real barrier between I was on a small platform so people could touch me they could reach for me so it was anyway it was interesting I don't have documentation of that night um, unfortunately but it definitely was memorable um, I think I think the rules are important and I think the for me the rules are instinctive and so part of what I try to do as a performer is continue to hone my intuition and to hone my instinct. That it's not, um, right, instinct is kind of comprised of knowledge that we gain over time. We think about, um, you know, a very common example, Malcolm Gladwell Blink, and he talks about how like the tennis coach can just see a young, you know, young athlete hit the ball once and know this person's got something. It's like, well, how do they know? They like barely looked at them for a minute. Or I feel like I can, I can see a dancer walk across the stage and be like, oh, wow, okay, there's something there. But it comes from having seen so much dance and been in the studio and understanding the sort of cohesiveness. I had a dance teacher, she used to say that the dancing is really what happens in between the steps or the moves, that's where the real dancing is. So when I can see someone who can do that, like it's not the, the, the you know, turn or the pirouette, it's the, the steps that you take after that before you do the next big move, that's actually the real dancing. Um, and so I think it's, it's very important to maintain those rules um, and not in any kind of restrictive way, but it's, it's about sometimes having a, a barrier that you can push against creatively, but it's also about having a protection. So in, uh, in the church, we talk about hedge of protection, you know, sending angels to form a hedge of protection. So I feel like if I'm going to do a piece, particularly where I make myself um, physically or emotionally vulnerable, then I want a hedge of protection around me. And that usually comes in the form of um, Black women collaborators. Um, do we have one more? Let's let's take one more question. I think I think we got yeah we have time for one more. 
I have so many questions, but I think I've um, taken up all my, and I could always talk to you, Matt, there. That's true. Right. Okay. I would also just welcome hearing some thoughts from people about rememory, mm. time, if anyone wants to share some thoughts, either out loud or in the chat. And I would also happily take another question too. I have a question, maybe I'm going to turn, put on my prof professor hat. Um, you already mentioned something about um, in Paris performing moneymaker, and you say you did not document it, or you don't have good documentation. Can yeah. you please talk about, the, talk about your development and the significance of documentation in your work, especially, especially performances, right, that are ethereal? Um, ethereal, not ethereal. Ephemeral. Uh, ephemeral, yes. And it ethereal can be at ethereal times. at times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and how, what, what does it mean to document a performance? Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where, like, what, for me, just as a sort of student of art and art history, like, I'm amazed when I look at, um, you know, um, oh gosh my brain today, Adrienne Piper. And the fact that she has like this video footage of her being in character walking down the street, because especially back then it wasn't easy. And even in the early nineties, it wasn't easy. Like now it's like, you got a phone, I got a phone, let's document. But in the early nineties, you had to like get a friend who maybe worked at the, um, either owned a camera or, you know, worked at the, um, community television station and could like or was a student like you know the cameras were big and heavy and I just digitized my archive actually which is crazy so I got a grant and um like took this bag of VHS tapes high eight tapes flip cameras like so many formats plus DVDs like even things that you know were being used 10 or 12 years ago aren't being used now. And so A, just having access to the various technology to be able to document the work. Um, it's really important. I think it's also a big factor in sort of who gets remembered and who doesn't, or who's able to, you know, have a retrospective. And it's also the awareness. Like I remember when Io and I would collaborate, like back in the day, Io was very like, I'm going to get the video camera. And I'm just sort of like, I don't know, I'm just going to do stuff, you know? <laughs> um, and so I don't think even the, the importance of documentation was fully clear to me at the beginning. And then even when it was clear, I didn't always have them the means to document the work. Um, so, you know, there are small regrets. But then also, I think there's something wonderful when something exists if we're going to talk about rememory, right? It exists in the stories that people tell each other. Like, remember that crazy night in Paris, and then this thing happened, and that thing happened. So it exists always for the people who were there. Um, and I imagine that also people going back to that space after we left, like sort of this like random collective of black artists from like Seattle and New York and DC, all converged in Paris to take over the space, that has changed that space forever, even though I've never seen it since, but it still exists. Oh, thank you so much, Holly. I think, uh, wait, I see something in the, in the chat. Oh, okay. Um, thank you so much, Holly. Um, just want to say, yeah, this was amazing. I'm so happy you were able to come. And um, if any of you all have any questions, folks here, um, you all know my email. I can forward it to Holly. And um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Io. Thank you, Sven. I appreciate it being here. This is thank you. lovely. Thanks so much. This was great. And uh, thanks to everyone. We will now.